God, help us to do that tonight, Lord. And also, I pray that you would please just help us to not get distracted easily today, that, that we could remain focused on the subject at hand, dear Lord. It's in Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, our main passage today is coming from the book of Deuteronomy, of course, Old Testament. And here at Word of Truth Baptist Church, we don't just, fo we don't just preach out of the New Testament. We preach out of the whole Bible. We believe that there are some differences that have been made in the New Testament when it comes to offering sacrifices and order of service and the Levitical priesthood and things like that. But by and large, God did not just give us this whole huge book of the Old Testament for no reason to where, you know, this is the Old Testament and this is the New Testament. And, and just because we're in the New Testament doesn't mean that, that this is all we have to follow. You see, God doesn't have to repeat everything that was in the Old Testament in order to look at it as truth today. The Bible teaches us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for instruction, and, you know, for, for reproof, for rebuke, and, and instruction in righteousness. The, all of the, of the Bible is valuable. We can learn just because this is in the Old Testament doesn't mean it's not applicable today. And the subject I'm going to be dealing with you know, I don't think this is taught very much in churches in general in this day and age. It's, it's something that people will look at and kind of scoff at a little bit. And what I'm teaching on is the subject of witchcraft and magic and psychics and this type of, you know, that, that do exist today. This is, this is very much a part of our society, it's a part of our culture. It, it, it exists, and it's wicked, and it's wrong. And I'll tell you, you know, it doesn't have to be repeated, everything in the New Testament, just, just to say that, no, this is still wrong. The Bible says it here. And again, you know, people will say, oh, what a witch, and they'll kind of laugh at it. And people will, will talk mockingly and disparagingly even about the, um, like the Salem witch trials. Now, I'm not a big history expert. I don't know a lot about everything that happened there, but I do know that people will mockingly say, oh yeah, these religious zealots, these religious nuts, you know, went on this witch hunt. And that's why even that term, like a witch hunt, people will use that as a, as a mockery yeah. of just saying, oh yeah, you're just off on some witch hunt. Like you're just off to, basically what they're saying is that, that you're just, you just want to persecute somebody basically for no cause. But that's not true. I mean, that's the way it's used today when people say, oh, you're just on some witch hunt. But when the Bible talks about, about witches and necromancers and all these different types of people, God was very serious about, about not doing these things. Look down in your Bibles where we, we just read there, but look at verse number nine. He's giving them a warning. And because this is Moses talking to the children of Israel in the book of Deuteronomy. This is right before they're going into the promised land. They've come out of Egypt, they've been in the wilderness, and Moses is basically laying down the law of God, saying this is God's laws, this is what God said, here's his rules, here's his statutes, here's his judgments. Verse 9 says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. He's saying, you know, you're going here. God, God is ordained that they need to be wiped out because they were extremely wicked. And when you start looking at, especially in, in, Levit in Leviticus, in chapters 18, 19, and 20, it really lays down a lot of serious laws about like, you know, kidnapping and adultery and homosexuality and all these various sins. And, it, and it's, it, you know, it's saying this is the judgment, you know, and most of them are the death penalty. And God's saying, and, and you know, then it goes into really weird stuff with like a woman laying down with a beast and, you know, all these things. And you're looking at this saying like, who in the world would do these things? I mean, this is just really bizarre. But then it goes on to say, all of the, those nations that, that they were going to war with and they were kicking out of the promised land, basically, and they were, when they were taking over that, because God bringing his judgment on them because they did all those things. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that they did all of those things. And you look at that, how could somebody get so perverted and so weird and so wicked and so low to do that stuff? The Bible said they did all those things. So God's saying here in Deuteronomy 18, he says, look, when you get into that land, you know, you're going to see the stuff that they're doing. I don't want you learning their ways and doing the things that they were doing. You are, you are sanctified people. You are holy. You are here to serve me. They were serving false gods and they didn't know the Lord. And he's saying, no, you are my people and you are going to serve me. I don't want you learning their ways. And then he goes on in verse 10 to say, there shall not be found among you 
anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Now what they were doing, that's, called, that's children, child sacrifices. People were really doing this. They were, they were thinking it was some great sacrifice that they were making to their false god, that their false god would be pleased with them for, for giving up one of their children. Now you look at that and be like, that, that, is, that is wicked. That is, how could anyone think that that is godly or that is righteous or that would be a good thing? But these people did. They would look at that and be like, wow, I'm giving such a great sacrifice. You know, this is my child. And what it is, it's, a, it's really a perversion of the gospel. It's a perversion of the truth. Because you think of, you know, God gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ to pay for the sins of the whole world and what they were doing they were perverting that gospel into thinking that they can give their children to, to somehow be a, a, a pleasing sacrifice unto God which it's not Jesus Christ is was a perfect human a perfect human being he was God in the flesh and he came to, to take the sins to bear the sins of the whole world and to pay the penalty for our sins but when you know when these people were offering up their child sacrifices and actually causing their children to pass through the fire, burning their children to death, they thought that that was a good godly thing. And God's saying, you know, that's wicked and abominable. And of course it is. You, know, you, you don't even need to be very knowledge in the Bible to know that that's wrong, that that's wicked. You know, any normal sane person can see, you know, I'm not supposed to be sacrificing my children and just putting them through the fire. But look at what this is associated with. So he says that first. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter pass through the fire or that useth divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. So it's not a coincidence that the people who are sacrificing their children are linked up with these people who are into witchcraft, who are doing sorcery, who are into this magic, who are into this type of stuff. They go together. And that's why you'll find you know, the people doing the voodoo and stuff. They do animal sacrifices. They, they do all kinds of weird things. And you'll even find some people today... Now, it's, it's, it's not like it's, it's well-known or publicized, obviously, that still do these, these satanic practices of human sacrifice. Yeah. And it's kept underground. It's, you know, obviously, you know, if anyone knew about that, they would, you know, they'd be in a lot of trouble. But um, this stuff still happens, and I believe that this stuff is real. So he says here, through verse 10, you know, sorry, in 10 he uses people who use divination. What's divination? Divination is people who is trying to basically learn or, or, or foretell the future. People who are into like fortune telling or, or being able to say, this is what's going to happen in the future. You're, you're using this divination. You know, the word divine would be like, like it's coming from God and you're, and you're saying of what's going to happen in the future. An observer of times. Now, when I talked about an observer of times, this is a lot of times people who are looking to the stars like the astrologers, because the times and the seasons, it's the years. Um, you think about the Mayan calendar. You think about other things in history. You know, th this was much more popular in ancient times, but it's still around today. People still look to the stars for answers. People still look to, you know, when the, when the planets line up when these comets come by and all this stuff to gain some kind of a knowledge, to gain some new information. And they, and they look to that for their source of truth of saying that, well, you know, the truth is written in the stars and we can divine this. We could observe this and understand more and, and give you some extra information um, by looking at these things. An enchanter, obviously someone who would use enchantments over people, over things. A witch, I think everyone's probably relatively familiar with what a witch is. Now, I'm sure there's probably a few different definitions of what a witch is, but we'll leave that there. A charmer, a consulter with familiar spirits, someone who's, who's accessing spirits, who's trying to be in communication with spirits. Again, we have that today. There's, there's psychics, there's these mediums that you can go to where they'll try to channel a spirit where you can literally try to talk to, an old, to a deceased relative or something like that. 
and um, or what says or a wizard or a necromancer. Now a lot of these 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 titles, these people kind of overlap into basically the same type of thing. It's this it's this magic, it's this psychic, it's this witchcraft, it's the tarot cards, it, it's that that whole realm is dealing with the same thing. And God's saying, you know what? I don't want that found among you, anybody. No, no one that does these things. He says in verse 12, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. An abomination is a very strong word. It's not just a light thing. When someone does something that's abominable, it's very hated in God's eyes. God looks at that with disdain. He says, this is, you know, not only is this a sin, not only is this wrong, he says, this is an abomination. It's, it's, it's language that God uses in the Bible to say this is, this is really bad. This isn't just, and, and you know, today people will look at this stuff as if it's not a big deal. And most people that do it, it's not necessarily like they really believe in it, but they may be participating in this for fun. Oh, well, let's just go to the fortune teller. Let's, you know, let's just go do these tarot cards. Let's, let's buy a Ouija board. Let's, you know, and it's, it's all kind of like fun and games, but it's not fun and games to God. Amen. God looks at this and he says, look, I don't want these people among you. Now, if God doesn't want these people found among them, does he think he, he wants you to go to these people? You know, I mean, it's, it just makes sense. If they're not even supposed to be there, you shouldn't be going and probably say, well, I'm not a witch. You know, I, I don't do these things. Well, then you shouldn't be going to these places either. You shouldn't be participating in this wickedness and going, even if it is just, you say, well, it's just for fun. I mean, it's just a joke. Lighten up. We'll see what God says the punishment is for this. Well, first, before we even get there, turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 28. Because we see a story here in 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel, you see um, King Saul. Saul was the first king of Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 20. I'll give you a few minutes to find it. Saul was the first king of Israel. After the judges, remember at the time of the judges that they judged uh, Israel and, and God's law was the law of the land. But the people, after a while, they said, no, we want to have a king. We don't, we don't want to just have judges. We want a king that's going to fight our battles for us. So they, re that was, they basically rejected God from being their king and they wanted a human king. Saul was the very first king that they had. Saul started off his, his reign doing a lot of good things and doing things for the Lord. And he was even prophesying and, and doing things like that. But then he kind of got backslidden. He got away from serving God. and he, did, he made some mistakes. He did some things that were wrong. And we're going to read about one of the wrong things that he did here. Because when he started his kingdom, one of the things he did, he established God's law of saying, look, there's not going to be any wizards or, or people who deal with familiar spirits. All of those people, that's illegal. Under Saul's reign, this was illegal. He did not want anyone doing this. And if they found him, they were going to be put to death. But now, near the end of Saul's, of Saul's reign, he was about to go to battle with the Philistines. And normally what you would do and what he tried to do was to consult the Lord, to consult God. And, and he'd go to a prophet and be like, hey, you know, I want to know from God is, you know, should I be going to war? How should I deal with this? How should I go forward? And he wasn't getting any answers. And at this point, Samuel had already died. So he didn't have Samuel there to guide him. He couldn't ask Samuel directly. And he was trying to ask God and God wasn't answering him because he was already kind of fallen out of grace with God. Saul was, was, had made some bad choices. Like I said, he was chasing after David and, and all these other things. So he's about to go to war. So what he decides to do then is to go to find a witch. And he, and he, wa he, cause he wants to talk to Samuel so bad. He wants to know how this war is going to come out. So it says in verse 5 of 1 Samuel 28, it says, And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit, Endor. So, and this also kind of speaks to Saul's attitude. Saul, one of the first mistakes he made was that he took it upon himself earlier when there was a battle with the Philistines. He took it upon himself to, to make a sacrifice unto God. But God was very clear in his commands. And he says, look, the 
only people that are allowed to, to do the actual sacrifices, you know, to, to kill the bull, to kill the lamb, were the, the Levites and the priests. Like that was their specific job. God had chosen them out to do this job. And Saul was not a Levite. Saul was of the family of Benjamin. It was not his, even though he was a king, it was not his position, it was not his place to offer up a sacrifice. So he was sitting there and he was waiting for Samuel and he's waiting for Samuel. Samuel was the prophet. Samuel was of the Levites. He was, it was his job to offer this sacrifice. He was the priest. And Saul's waiting and waiting. He's like, we can't wait anymore because the people are getting afraid, they're all gonna leave, and, and I just need to do this to make the sacrifice unto God. So he takes matters into his own hands, and he sins in the process, and God, God's not happy with him doing that. It actually cost him quite a bit by doing that. But we see he still doesn't learn from this. You know, he's going to God, God's not answering, so what does he do? He's saying, well, now I just, I, I just have to get through somehow, so even if I just do it you know, in a way that God told me not to do, I'm still going to do it anyways. And this was that, that, that same type of attitude that Saul had, which, which destroys him. He's not getting an answer from God, and he decides to just say, well, I'm going to take matters in my own hands and find someone with a familiar spirit. So verse number 8 says, And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, other clothing, and he went and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done. See, he disguised himself. She doesn't know that this is Saul. And she's saying, look, you know what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die. So she's saying like, wait a minute, why are you trying to trick me? You know what Saul did. You know he made it illegal. You know he got rid of, of everyone who has a familiar spirit of all these wizards, that, it, that it's against the law. He's like, she's, so she says to him like, why are you trying to lay a trap for me? Do you, you, want, you do want me to die? Verse 10, And Saul sware to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. Now, what's interesting about this story is that here's someone who dealt with familiar spirits. And she's like, you know, I don't want to do this. You know what the king said. And he's like, no, no, I promise. Like, nothing's going to happen to you. Everything's just fine. So she's like, okay, well, what do you, who do you want me to bring up? Who do you want to talk to? And he wants to talk to Samuel. So when she actually sees him, now, I believe today, in, this, in, in the modern day, there are a lot of charlatans out there. There are a lot of people who are just deceivers, that are just looking to make a buck. They're looking to trick people. It's fake. They go in and they'll say whatever you want to hear and they'll say all kinds of things. And it's just total garbage and they're not really doing anything. They're not, they're not talking to spirits. You know, they just, they're just in it to make some money and they're just gonna, gonna lie to you. But I don't believe that that's everybody. I believe this stuff is real. I believe that there are people out there who are really dealing with the spiritual world. The Bible talks about angels and the Bible talks about devils. And devils are really just fallen angels anyway. So it talks about spiritual beings that are around. They exist. They, they come back and forth between heaven and the earth. The Bible records this. Mm -hmm. The Bible talks about spiritual entities and spiritual beings. Now, I don't believe that these psychics are dealing with your dead loved one. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that, th that there's ghosts of, of people that are still around here because the Bible, again, is very clear about when somebody passes on, if they're saved, they go straight to heaven. And if they're not saved, they go straight to hell. There's no limbo. There's no in-between. It's one or the other. Whatever choice you've made in this life, if you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, hey, you're saved, amen, you're going to heaven, but you're going to heaven immediately. You're not hanging out around on this earth for a while. You go straight to heaven, but the same point, like in Luke 16, it gives us the story of, of Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man, it says, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. So like the rich man dies, the next thing he knows, he's just, he's looking up and he's just in hell immediately. Mm -hmm. But the same way that when, when Lazarus, was, who was a beggar, died, he was in Abraham's bosom. He was in heaven. He was there 
you know, in that afterlife. That's where people go. I don't believe in this, in, in, you know, people whose ghosts are around on this earth for a while. But what I do believe is that when people have, you know, they see things, I don't discount that. Because I do believe we have, uh, there is a spiritual aspect of angels and devils that, that are around on this earth. And there's stories of that. There's a story of um, even when Samuel was, was with, uh, no, was it Elijah? Elisha. Excuse me, it was Elisha. And he kept on telling the king where the armies were going to be so that, so that they, wouldn't get, they wouldn't get hurt. You know, he kept on telling the, the, other, the other nation was, was trying to invade. And every time they tried to do an attack, Elisha was saying, hey, you know, like, they're going to come and get you here. So they would never fall for their traps. So the other, the other army, the other king is like, man, he's like, they're like, who's the traitor? Who is it that's against us? Who's revealing our secrets unto them? And they're like, no, it's Elisha. So they came to go and just in like arrest Elisha so that he can't be, be messing up their plans. And he was there with his servant. Um, I think a Hazai, and and they came. You know, he has this whole army came and surrounded him. And Elisha's not worried at all. And his servants like, look, like what are we gonna do? And he says, look, there's more that are with us than that are with them. And it's just the two of them standing there. And then he prays to God. He says, God, open up his eyes that he may see. So God opens up his eyes. He's able to see there's all these chariots and angels and stuff all surrounding him and defending him. Now look, I believe the Bible is God's word. I don't believe this is just some fairy tale. And if the Bible's saying it, I believe that to be true. That actually happened. These angels do exist, and I believe people can see them. But what I think where people get confused is that there's also devils that are around and they have knowledge and information of people in their lives. So when a person might go to some of these psychics or one of these dealers of familiar spirits and they hear information about their loved one, it's not because it's from their loved one. It's because it's because from a devil who knew that information about them and this person's actually dealing and talking, communicating with the devil. I believe that to be true. And I think there's plenty of evidence from the Bible to support that. And these people, you know, if it was all just garbage and didn't mean anything, I don't think that God's punishment of the death penalty, which we'll see in a little bit, is what he put for this, for this sin, for this wickedness. But let's keep reading the story here. Because now she sees something different. She's not used to this at all because she freaks out when she sees Samuel. She was not expecting that at all. So this business that she did with dealing with familiar spirits, this is something different. This is something she's never experienced before. Verse 13 says, And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Now, again, this really happened. She actually did bring Samuel up, because the Bible is saying right here that Samuel said to Saul, this isn't just a, um, a fakery. Samuel, according to the Bible, according to the narrator of the Bible, Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee, and is become thine enemy? And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me. For the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand, and given it to thy neighbor, even to David, because thou obeyedst not the voice of the Lord, nor executed his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Then Saul fell straightway all along the, on the earth and was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no bread in all the day nor all the night. So we see here, he said, you know, Samuel's saying, like, why did you even come? To me, 
What You already know God's against you, so what in the world are you thinking coming to me and further sinning by going to a dealer of familiar spirits? And he tells them basically that he's going to die. And what's interesting here, and this is just a little bit of a side note, it has nothing to do with the, with the topic at hand. When Samuel says unto Saul, he says, um, verse 19, Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. If you know the story of Saul, later on, he commits suicide. He falls on his own sword in the battle. You know, he's losing the battle. He's lost his son, and they're coming, and he's, he knows he's going to lose this, this war. So what he says, he says, well, I don't want them to do like bad things, you know, to, to capture me and to just who knows what they'll do with me. So he decided to kill, to fall on his own sword. First, he asked his servant, he's like, hey, you know, kill me. And the servant was afraid. He's like, I'm not going to kill you. You're the king, you know. So he fell on his own sword and he died that way. Now, the reason why I'm even bringing this up, because there's a lot of people who believe that, well, if you commit suicide, then you're automatically going to hell. And that's mainly a Catholic teaching, but that teaching is false. Amen. We see here Samuel, who we know was in heaven. Samuel was a prophet of the Lord. Samuel was, was a righteous man. He did you know, the right things, but it's not, obviously salvation isn't by doing the right things. But we know that Samuel was a prophet of the Lord that, that was saved. And when he said that you're going to be with me, it's easy to tell that, well, Saul's going to be with Samuel. And if Samuel's in heaven, then that means Saul's going to be in heaven as well. And the reason why Saul was saved was simply because he put his faith in the Lord. Even though he did all these bad things, even though he did this wickedness, even though he consulted a familiar spirit, even though he did all these bad things, he ended up killing himself at the end of his life, he still was saved and went to heaven. And I just wanted to point that out because this is one of the proof texts that you can use when, when people don't understand this and you want to show them from the Bible that, no, this is true. And, um, uh, um, oh, why am I thinking Goliath? Um, uh, Samson was, was another example of someone who killed himself. Yeah. But he was also had the Spirit of the Lord upon him and um, another person that's, that's recognized in the, in the faith chapter and that he, we believe he also went to heaven even though he ended up taking his own life as well. But back to the subject matter. We have Saul here consulting a familiar spirit and basically he ends up dying and look at, um, so flip back to Exodus chapter 22. Or no, you know what? No, never mind that. Go to um, 1 Chronicles 10. You don't need to turn. Exodus 22, 18 just says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. God's giving all these commands. And, and verse 18 just says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. So God, that's where God institutes the death penalty on witches, on, on the, the sin of, of being a witch and dealing with these spirits and doing this type of thing. God says that that is, that is something that is worthy of death. 1 Chronicles chapter 10 explains the, you know, the whole reason why I went into that story about King Saul and, and bringing up, going to the witch to bring up uh, Samuel is because 1 Chronicles chapter 10 explains that story to us in a little bit more detail. In verse 13 of 1 Chronicles chapter 10, the Bible reads, so, so Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also, so when it says Saul died, he also died for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it and inquired not of the Lord. Therefore, he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. So in 1 Chronicles 10, we see that because, because Saul did this. Now, he wasn't a witch. He wasn't someone who dealt with familiar spirits. But, excuse me, he went to someone who did that stuff. And that made God so angry. That's one of the reasons why God took his life. Now, he, you know, Saul wasn't executed and put to death, but God made sure that it happened, that his life was taken from, that he lost that battle. And, um, you know, this isn't something, you know, this is something that we need to consider, that we need to make sure that, that we deal with this appropriately, not just, just laugh it off and say, well, ah, yeah, well, whatever, it's not a big deal. No, in God's eyes it is. Maybe it's not a big deal to the world. Maybe it's not a big deal to your friends. Maybe it's not a big deal to your family. It's a big deal to God. So who do we care about? Do we care about what God thinks or do we just care about what people think? 
The world today, they're not going to care if you go to a psychic. They'll just think it's funny. You can tell your coworkers and everyone will get a good laugh. But God's not going to get a good laugh out of it. Le Leviticus. Turn if you would to Leviticus 20. We'll just see a few, a little bit more of God's law regarding this. And you know, remember I was saying Leviticus 18, 19, and 20 kind of go into a lot of these different laws of, of what the, the people were doing that was in, this, in the promised land, the Canaanites and the, the Hittites and the Perizzites and the, the Hivites and the Jebusites. All the things that they were doing. Leviticus 19.31 says, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. So there's a scripture that's telling you not to go and see these people. right? And then Leviticus 20 Verse number six says, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. And then verse 27 of Leviticus 20 reads, A man also or a woman that hath a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. This is how serious God, God takes this, this type of a sin. These people who are dealing with devils. People who are dealing with, with spirits and devils and getting into this type of nonsense. And what we really have to be very careful about is, is that they're targeting children. And kids, I want you listening up right now. Because, you know, mom and dad will teach you that, you know, we don't believe in magic and in this witchcraft. And, and, you know, there's certain books that we look at. We read these things. You know, we, we, we have to kind of monitor what we're allowing our kids to be exposed to. We look at the books. We look at the, the videos or whatever it is that they're going to see because we don't want this influence creeping in. But what they're doing today, it's, it's, it's completely targeted towards children. And you think about, you know, they target it in a way, you say, oh, well, this is a good witch. Or I think of, of even, what's that, um, the Wicked Witch of the West, what, the, the Wizard of Oz, right? The Wizard of Oz. Okay, I watched that as a kid. It's a classic. It's something that probably everybody's seen except for my children and probably Jacob. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's one of those things where you had, the, you had the good witch, the fairy godmother, and then you had the bad witch. And they separate between the two. Now, where in the Bible does it say there's good witches and bad witches? It doesn't make a distinction. The Bible just says, look, you shall not suffer a witch to live. This type of magic, getting into these types of powers, and people look at it and say, oh, well, that's just fantasy. It's just make-believe. No, I mean, these people really exist. The Bible wouldn't be talking about fairy tales if it's just really a fairy tale, if it's just, just make-believe, if it's just myth, if it's just legend. Why would God waste time in His Word to tell us about something that's not even true at all? This stuff is true. And that's how they spin it, though. They try to say, oh, well, there's, there's good ways of doing magic. And that's where you get people who are Wiccan, People who, who are into that type of magic and they'll say, well, no, this is all really good. I want to help people. I'm a white witch is one of the things they'll say. You know, I want to help people. I'm doing these things for the betterment of them. And you know, I don't care how you spin it. God said not to mess with that stuff. Because what you're doing is you're delving into a realm that you really don't know anything about. You're delving into this spiritual realm, into these dark powers. You could call them white powers if you want. It doesn't change what they really are. You're getting into stuff that God doesn't want us messing with at all. And that he puts serious punishments on of, of if you want to try to go that way. I think the way that it's targeted towards children, it's not just in those movies and stuff, but it, I mean, it's in everything. You think of Disney with Sleeping Beauty. You think of Disney with, with just about everything. They have some element of magic in it. They have um, even Ouija boards. Now, it's produced by a game manufacturer like Hasbro. Right, Hasbro, Parker Brothers, whatever, they make Monopoly, they make all these board games. Oh, and by the way, they also make Ouija boards. Mm -hmm. Right? The kids are in the, in the toy section. I mean, you could go to like the toy store and literally find one of these Ouija boards. Now look, people say, oh yeah, that's garbage stuff. Unfortunately, I participated in this stuff, and I'll tell you, this stuff is not just a gimmick. 
I, I believe that these things, you get, you're, you're opening up doors that you shouldn't be opening up. Yep. Okay, and I'll leave it at that. That's, you, you end up doing things that you ought not to be doing, and it can be scary, the stuff that happens. And God warns us. He says, look, don't mess with any of that stuff. We have to be continually checking our kids' books, their toys, for elements containing magic and witchcraft. And I want you kids listening up because, you know, it's one thing to hear mom and dad say, well, we don't, we don't agree with this. We don't believe in magic. But you need to understand why. Because you're going to be growing up and understanding a little bit more. You need to understand why this is so bad. I'm glad that you, you can recognize some things and you tell us and, and, and you're very good at it saying, Dad, you know, this has magic and we shouldn't be watching this. And you're right, we shouldn't. But the reason why is because the source of all this is coming from the devil. Amen. It's coming from Satan. It's satanic powers. And I'll show you that. Turn, if you would, to Exodus chapter number 7. And it's all around you today, even today. I mean, you've got the Lord of the Rings. You've got Harry Potter, just to name the really popular stuff. This all delves into that realm of, of spirits and magic and witchcraft. I mean, Harry Potter is a wizard. It's not even by another name. I mean, he's a wizard. And the Bible says that wizards are to be put to death. So do you think we ought to be showing that to our children and saying, look, he's a good wizard. He does all these great things. And get him to learn to love a wizard? No. Now look, people might look at you and say, like, well, you're just crazy. You can call me crazy all you want, but I'm sorry. God, again, God didn't write this for no reason. And just because it's accepted by the world and really popular doesn't make it right. And if we want to be honest about this stuff, and if you honestly want to serve God, if you honestly want to know how God feels about things, then let's get it from the Bible and let's apply this to our life. There's so many bad things in this world and Satan really is the God of this world. He's, he's, he's running the show on so many levels and it's allowed to happen, yes, but let's not be deceived by all this sin and all the witchcraft and all the things that are out there. Let's, let's get some wisdom and, and teach our children, right? And, and don't even let ourselves get, get suckered into this stuff. As I was saying earlier, I believe that magic is real. Now, there's a lot of people out there who use the sleight of hand stuff, right? I don't, I'm not calling that magic. There's people that know how to do tricks, you know, they're real fast with their hands, and they can do these card tricks and stuff, and you know what kind of fun? And honestly, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with, with doing that. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of silly, it's kind of fun, oh yeah, he did these things. But I do believe that there is real magic that's real. That's not just people doing, you know, some sleight of hand. They've got a card up their sleeve or whatever, you know. I mean, they're doing these things and they get pretty fancy with it. But um, I do believe magic is real. And the reason why, if you're in Exodus chapter 7, we're going to see that where people, you know, this was, this was back, just to give you a little bit of uh, information about where we're at in the Bible right now. In Exodus 7, Moses was confronting Pharaoh. The children of Israel are all in bondage. You know, they're all suffering. They're, being, they're, they're slave labor. And Moses and Aaron are going into Pharaoh and they're telling him, look, you need to let us go. We need to go worship the Lord, right? And this is at the time when he brings all these plagues upon Egypt and Pharaoh still hardens his heart. and He's not listening to him. He doesn't let him go all the way up until the point to where the firstborn son in the whole land of Egypt gets killed and he finally just, just says, get out of here, right? And sends him out. But what's interesting here, if you're in Exodus chapter 7, this is, this is the beginning of these plagues upon, and it starts kind of small, right? They start showing him these small proofs, these small miracles, if you want to call them that, you know, um, before it starts escalating, escalating, escalating to the point to where the firstborn child is dead in the land of Egypt. Anyone who didn't have the blood of the lamb over their doorposts. Exodus 7, look at verse number 8. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Look at this, verse 11. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers 
Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rod. So everything God does is always better. But don't look over this. Their sorcerers, their magicians, had this power to perform the same type of miracle. They cast down their rods, and they became snakes. Now, of course, Aaron's rod just, just swallowed up theirs. But, but that's a power that they did. It doesn't say that was just using mirrors. Right? That wasn't just trickery, deceit. No, they did the same thing. Look at uh, verse number 20. It says, And Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod and smote the waters. This is the next plague. He smote the waters that were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. And the fish that was in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river, and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, neither did he hearken unto them, as the Lord said. So here's another thing that, that these wizards, these, these um, magicians were actually able to do. They're actually able to do some of these things that, that um, Moses and Aaron were doing. Now, I also want to point out too, they're never able to make it not happen, you know, to, to take it back. Like, like when Moses and Aaron are turning the, the waters into blood, the magicians aren't able to just clear it and be like, yeah, no, everything's fine. Yeah. They, they didn't have that time. So they're, they're very limited in their power, but they have real powers here. The, these, these magical powers that, that they have, and these are not of God. Verse, or chapter number 8, we see, we'll see another one that they're able to do. Chapter 8, verse 5, And the Lord spake unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. And then jump down to verse 16, it says, and the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so, for Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord said. So from this point forward, the magicians aren't able to reproduce any of these miracles that, that Aaron and Moses are doing. And they've, they've reached their limit. But I've read through these things to point out, look, they have these powers. And this was real. This was stuff they were really able to do. Which is another reason why I believe, look, there are people today that are tapping into these powers, that are using sorcery, that are using enchantments, that are doing things that they're not supposed to be doing, that God said not to do, but they have these real powers to do these types of things. In Acts chapter 8, no, I don't want to go there. Let's go to... Um, Where am I at with time? I got, we got a lot of time. I want to hit this point next. In Daniel chapter 8, we're going to see, because there's going to be a resurgence, of, a resurgence of witchcraft when the Antichrist comes to power. Mm -hmm. This stuff is real, but it's going to come back again. I mean, right now, I don't think it's just hugely popular. You know, these people exist. You can see, we, I think we've got one in town somewhere here. They put up a little sign saying that they're some psychic or whatever. But... This is going to come back even more in the last days. And I believe we're in the last days, but, but when the Antichrist is in power, Daniel 8 tells us in verse 23, Daniel, Daniel at the, the latter chapters of Daniel talk a lot about prophecy and end times type of stuff. And it's kind of dark. It's not always easy to understand. But we could see here in verse 23 of Daniel 8, the Bible reads, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. So here he's talking about a king that understands dark sentences. People who he, he understands that, you know, the 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 witchcraft, dark powers, things like that. And verse 24 says, And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. 
And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. So this is talking about the Antichrist having his power, but this is not his own power because Satan, the dragon, is the one giving him his power. The, 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 Satan's the one giving the Antichrist his power to do these things. And the Bible also explains that in Matthew chapter 24, that he's going to come with, with lying signs and wonders. When the Antichrist comes into power, people are going to be wondering, and they're going to accept him as if he is the second coming of Jesus Christ because he's going to have a lot of signs and these miracles. And the Bible says they're going to be so convincing that even the elect, if it were possible, they'd also believe, but it's not possible. So people who are saved, because you have the Spirit of God within you, you're not going to be deceived by his miracles, but anyone who's not, who's not saved, who doesn't have the Spirit of God, they will be deceived by these things because they're going to be so convincing, because the miracles they're able to do. I mean, think about these guys. What if you saw someone, you know, taking a rod and making it a snake, and you saw someone, you know, turning water into blood, and you saw someone just bringing frogs up out of the ground and had this type of powers? You, you might be amazed by that. You might be like, wow, that's pretty incredible, and, and you might be deceived into thinking this is the power of God. And in Acts chapter 8, we actually see an example of somebody who did deceive the people, the community where he lived, into thinking that he was someone that had God's power, at least until the apostles came and preached him the truth and preached him about Jesus Christ. And I'll just read this for you. You could turn there if you'd like, or you could just turn to Galatians 5. It'll be the last place we go to. I could read for you from Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 verse 5 says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. Again, another reason why I believe these things are real. The Bible talks about these people who are possessed with spirits. They're possessed with devils. And the apostles were able to come and cast the devils out that were plaguing them, that were, you know, and we see all of the, the signs of them, people, you know, falling down on the ground and tearing themselves. Everything that you pretty much think of a possessed person is laid out in the Bible. People cutting themselves, and the Bible says, you know, there's a man that went to Jesus and said, you know, my son is lunatic, and he's sore vexed, and he says oftentimes he's throwing himself into the water and into the fire, you know, and trying to kill himself, and, and all these things. These are attributes of people who are possessed with the devil, or with a devil. Again, in Acts chapter 8, we see Philip, and they're, and they're casting out unclean spirits, People who are possessed with devils, verse 8 says, And there was great joy in that city. People are being healed. It's a, it's a, there's a lot of joy. And verse 9, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out him that himself was some great one. So he's telling everyone that, he, Oh, I'm some great man of God. And, and he was using sorcery to trick the people. It says, to whom they all gave heed. People all listened to this guy from the least to the greatest saying, this man is the great power of God. So they, would, they were listening to this guy who was, who was able to do these sorcery, use his sorcery and enchantments over people to think that he really was from God. Verse 11 says, and to him they had regard because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. See, the power of Christ is stronger even than these, these, these sorcerers who are able to trick people and bewitch people. When they heard about Christ, they're just like, no, like that is the power of God. They were able to receive Christ as their Savior and get saved and get baptized and then no longer be bewitched by this sorcerer because God's power is always greater than the power of the devil. Verse 13 says, Then Simon himself believed also. So this guy who was, who was tricking people and using sorceries, even he got saved. Even he believed also, it says, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip 
and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. In Galatians 5, like I said, it's the last place we'll turn. I just wanted to point out here that this is not just Old Testament stuff. It's not just Old Testament doctrine. It's not just found in the Old Testament. It's not mentioned a whole lot in the New Testament besides the, the people casting out devils, people who are possessed. But in Galatians chapter 5, we're going to see here in verse number 19, it starts off reading, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. So it starts ma ma you know, listing off these sins that are the works of our flesh, our sinful flesh that want to do these things, right? And saying these are all wrong. This is what your flesh is going to want you to do. Get into adultery, get into fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Verse 20, idolatry, witchcraft. So there we see witchcraft again mentioned in the New Testament as being a sin, as being a lust of the flesh, of being something that we shouldn't be getting into. Witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you, off, told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So stern warnings, even in the New Testament, regarding this stuff. Now look, I know it's played off as being harmless. I know it's, 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 it's looked at today as not a big deal. But you know what? Most sins today are looked at as not a big deal. Fornication is looked at as not a big deal. You know, people sleeping around when they're not married, it's looked at as not a big deal. People committing adultery, it's looked at as not a big deal. I mean, you see it on the movies, you see it on the TV all the time, and it's becoming normalized. People these days are starting to think it's not a big deal for a man to lie with man. Yeah. The Bible calls that abomination worthy of the death penalty. Adultery worthy of the death penalty. And in this world today, this crazy world we live in, people are saying, eh, it's not a big deal. Eh, just do whatever you want. Uh, who cares? We need to get back to the Bible and get back to God's way of thinking on things and not just think that we're so smart and that sin's okay and that there's no problem and just, just keep on sending this, this, this country and our culture to hell and, and, and making it worse for our children to grow up in. Everyone's got their own choices to make. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's why I teach my children the Bible and that's why we try. Now look, are we perfect? No. If you look at me close enough, are you going to find things wrong that I do? Yes, because I'm a sinner too. But ask yourself, is your attitude, is your mindset one that says, well, I really want to please God? I'm going to be able to take an honest look at his word and I want to please him and I want to make things as good as possible. The, the best that I possibly can, I want to look at his words and be right in his eyes. Amen. Or do you just say, I don't really care what God says. And I'm just going to do what I want to do because it makes me feel good or because whatever. And I'm just going to ignore God and ignore what he has for me. And that, you know, that's a question that you have to ask yourself. Do I really care what the Bible says? I do. And hopefully you can see t tonight what God is teaching about witchcraft, about magic, about sorcery, about these different things. It's wicked. That's what God thinks about it. Okay, now what you do with that is your business, but I'm teaching you today the Bible says that this is wrong and this is wicked and this is a sin. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words of wisdom. Dear God, every law that you have for us, dear Lord, is, is provided for our benefit. If we could only get that through our heads sometimes, dear God, with, with whatever the sin may be, whatever it is that we really like to do, God, you've made these laws for a reason. You've showed us this truth so that we don't have to fall into these, these traps and these pitfalls of the sins that, that are laid out in the Bible, dear God, that it's only going to bring misery. It's only going to bring sorrow. As we mentioned this morning about the love of money, or even tonight about witchcraft and you know these psychics and tarot card readers and all this other stuff, these sorcerers, your God. Help us not to get sucked into that stuff because it's only going to bring us misery and sorrow. And like in Saul's case, it brought him death. I pray that you would please stir up our hearts 
to want to know more about you and more about how we should be living our lives and this perspective that we need to have about these various sins, dear Lord, and the seriousness of them, especially when we read a sin that, that says it's, it's worthy of the death penalty according to you, according to your righteous law and judgment, dear God, I pray that that will stick with us even more so that we don't let this world influence us into thinking that it's really not a big deal when you said it's worthy of death. God, sometimes we're fighting against this world and, and these things might sound radical, they might sound extreme, dear Lord, but that's just because of our own conditioning from this world. Help us to, to be able to cleanse our minds and cleanse our hearts and to get a righteous attitude that comes from your word, dear God. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.